I have to say right away that I understand 100% anybody who wants to own a wild animal. I sure did. I had posted a video about six years ago. It's called Voodoo Lounging, where it's just me rubbing the top of his head. Now, Voodoo is declawed. So he's reaching up and he's grabbing my hand, and I'm always aware that he's going to pull my hand towards his mouth and try to bite me. He's got his claws out, but he's using this guttural sound, sort of like a purring noise. So I'm rubbing his head, and, and it's just that sound, and it sounds like this motorboat. I guess it's the sound in it, the sound he was making that made it so famous, but at some point or another the segment became almost meme-like because it says, you know, would you pet this cat for however many dollars? And it's taken many different forms. Um, they've incorrectly labeled him as a jaguar before, incorrectly labeled him as a cheetah before. You know, there's, there's a lot of power in uh, the viral videos. Unfortunately, there's also the ability for that to really be abused. And all of the annotations that I put in that video in YouTube explaining Voodoo's history were lost. We don't have the attention spans anymore that it's something that's absorbed and, and they just move on. But, you know, in the long run, it, it brings awareness. Whether it raises awareness for us or the fact that this is happening elsewhere, it's getting people talking. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, there are a lot of judgments on an enclosure that you can't even see. It doesn't, the frame isn't wide enough to really see where he is and how big it is. I actually had a phone call coming in from New Jersey about a year ago. And the girl called me and she said, I posted the YouTube video of Voodoo online on my Facebook page and I'm getting a lot of controversy and I'm calling you to find, kind of get the backstory because I want to make sure I have the story right. And I truly appreciated that. And I told her, the people that had him before us declawed him. He didn't have any claws and he didn't have a home. So we took him in and his enclosure is much bigger than the frame that that camera allows for. And that he's a happy, um, content leopard, as happy as, a, as an animal can be in captivity. And he gets a lot of love and attention and he's fed very well and he's taken care of. And we spoke for about an hour and she, went and posted this on her Facebook page because she was she was struggling with all of the commentary she was getting by posting that. And so I really appreciated her her effort to find the answers, to find the true story and not make judgment on something that she had no idea. Well, I've, I've been contacted by several production companies who've asked for permission, fortunately, to use the video in their various television productions. And uh, that resulted in a Danish TV show in which we've had two groups just this past year who specifically made trips through this part of the U.S. on their trip over to see this because of what they saw on the television show. These cats, because they're in captivity and they have no sanctuary in the wild, the best we, use we can find for them is ambassadors. That they draw the public out to allow us to tell the story. They get the public involved. Once you've come out here, you will not leave here unchanged. Whether your opinion is worse or most likely much for the better, of what facilities like us are able to accomplish and do in terms of conservation when you're facing a 20-year ticking clock before the extinction of the, the first of the large apex predators, the panthera, you see why it's more critical than ever that we ramp up our efforts, not just to conserve and preserve these animals, but to spearhead the efforts that are going to restore the wild so that they will have sanctuary in the future. The biggest issue with that viral video is that it's lost its true value in, in terms of coming from a sanctuary. It also is implied sometimes as being private ownership as well. When it comes to private ownership, it's a very, very dangerous thing, especially in the pet setting. One of these predators are capable of taking down prey that are three, five times our size that have weaponry that we don't have on our bodies. And so even their play, which is a practice of hunting, can be very fatal to us. With that idea comes not only human danger, um, but it also paints kind of a very dark picture for big cats when it creates a fear mentality.
towards them. And the last thing our wild populations need is any resemblance of fear mentality. I'm not completely against private ownership because I think that isn't fair. If somebody's educated and they know what they're doing and they have the facility to do it and they have the means to do it, um, I do understand it, but I think it's, it's when people don't know, don't do their research at first to realize that they need to know a lot before they get involved in a private ownership. There's a lot of veterinarians that aren't willing to work on your exotic animal. You need to research and make sure you have a vet that's ready to do that. So in most cases, people aren't ready to have an exotic animal living at their house. And unfortunately, what happens with some of the bigger animals they take is in, into private ownership, um, the animal gets aggressive, then the owners get scared, and then that's when abuse starts taking place and neglect, and that's when it didn't work out. The equation just didn't work out. You know, it, I do understand it, but you, you, you have to do it legally, and you have to do it responsibly if you're going to be a private owner. Private ownership is not a good idea, and we have several cats that have come to us that are perfect examples. Tom, our male cougar, who was purchased by a truck driver to be a ride-along companion. From three months to four months, everything was fine. By four months old, this ball of energy, claws, and fur that's bouncing around the inside of the truck needs a better environment, needs proper care. Same with Voodoo, our male leopard, who was purchased to be a house pet. The story was that the original private owners had acquired him in an exotic animal auction when he was about eight weeks old. Um, back then, there was not as many regulations on the private auctions, and so a private owner could buy an animal. And so they took him home, and, and, and from what I've been told, they did not have an outdoor enclosure for him. Um, they thought they could raise him to be a house cat. So unfortunately, they declawed him on all four paws, which is truly an amputation of the tip of the finger. Um, they thought that might help keep their house intact. Unfortunately, Voodoo still had his teeth. Thank goodness they didn't file down his teeth. Um, and he proceeded to be very destructive to their house. They bought him thinking he would grow up and maybe be a playmate for a couple of adult Rottweilers. By the time he was four months old, he was beating up the Rottweilers. What is a baby leopard to do with all of these, you know, other creatures running around its environment? It, it knows that it's supposed to hunt, and it knows it has a very limited amount of time before it's on its own as one of the most athletic predators of our world. He has a very short amount of time where he has to practice what he needs to do. So of course Voodoo is playing and he's practicing and he's using his paws, he's using his mouth, he's looking for places to jump off of. What people don't understand is that um, you can't take a wild animal and domesticate it. You can breed it with domesticated animals and eventually get an animal that replicates more of a domestic animal, but you can't take a wild animal and think that you're going to be able to domesticate it. It's taken thousands and thousands of years for it to have the instincts that it has. You are not going to be able to reverse that instinct by trying to put it in your house. And I have found through my experiences that's a very common understanding that, that people aren't aware that domestication takes thousands and thousands of years and it's more genetically driven than it is situationally driven um, and they truly think that the idea of taming can happen in one lifespan. So she thought that if there was some training she could do or some modification of the home that that he would then become more house cat like instead of more predatory like and our founder explained to her just how wrong that notion was and, and it truly explained that of all of the big cats she could have picked that a leopard was honestly one of the most dangerous <laughs> because of how truly agile they are and they're far more driven opportunistically than they are ambush related and so he stressed just how dangerous he would become and tried to put into light that your, your cubs only six months old at this time and you're concerned well how concerned are you going to be when it's an adult in his own way as he grew he was practicing his kill bite and so i'm sure he they uh, realized that no matter what they did they weren't going to be able to train him to be a domestic animal these are wild animals that have incredible power and incredible instincts and if you don't understand those drives and how to mitigate those you're not only putting yourself at danger and in risk as well as others but the animals themselves and for those animals to suffer from human curiosity because of you know a Disney-esque idea that we're going to have a tea party with a, a tiger and sit down with a bear and play dolls, it, 
we're, we're a mature enough species, I think, to realize the potency of these animals and the fact that our, our, our collective mentality does not apply to something that can kill you. Um, you put your, your thoughts and your focus into a, a, these animals and what they need, and your needs kind of go by the wayside. It doesn't matter what you need anymore, it matters what they need.